Hello everyone and welcome back to this week's space update. There's a whole bunch of stuff for me to cover today, from big starship development updates to news on the first commercial spacewalk, the first crewed starship flight announcement, and we've also seen two resupply missions to the International Space Station over the past week. So nothing else to say other than let's get into it. The barrage of news coming out of Boca Chica hasn't stopped flowing since last Monday's episode. It has once again been a very busy week for Starship development, which I know is a bold claim for me to make considering all the news in last week's episode, where we had the full Ship 20 Booster 4 stack, the final unveiling of Raptor 2 and all of its improvements, and of course we have the rest of Elon's Starship update presentation. Well, this past week has seen a great number of things take place down at Starbase as well. Impressive as the monstrous Ship 20 and Booster 4 stack was, it's not ready to launch just yet, and after Elon's Starship presentation, there was little need for SpaceX to keep it in its stacked configuration, and so earlier in the week, Ship 20 was lowered back down to its transport stand by the catch arms. It then underwent another cryoproofing test. I know it seems odd, considering Ship 20 has already undergone quite a number of cryo tests. I expect this was more of an integrity check to make sure that lifting the ship with the catch arms, something that's never been done before, hadn't in some way jeopardized its ability to hold fuel. Shortly after, on Friday, Booster 4 underwent another cryoproofing test, which also appeared to go well. Before this rocket can fly, a few things need to happen. I'm sure for SpaceX there's a few I's to dot and T's to cross regarding the orbital launch mount and the launch tower, and of course Booster 4 will need to undergo some pre-flight tests up to and including a static fire, as so far it's only undergone cryo proofing tests. And, of course, to address the elephant in the room, the FAA will need to grant SpaceX approval for flight. They had initially extended their review deadline to the end of February, but sadly, last week, they announced that they will need an additional month to finish their review before they can approve Starship for launch. This is obviously very disappointing news for Starship, but I suspect it isn't brand new news for SpaceX themselves, as Elon did mention in the Starship presentation that they were hoping to have approval by the end of March, with a launch date sometime in April. April. At the end of the day, the FAA received nearly 19,000 comments, and all of these will need to be manually reviewed. Also, rather humorously, some people seem to have begun theorizing that this is some sort of conspiracy from the government to ensure that SLS launches before Starship, which I have to say I have a hard time believing myself. <laughs> Ultimately, in addition to needing to review so many comments, Starship and Super Heavy constitute the biggest rocket ever built, and it's going to be launched in a natural reserve close to a populated area in in a place that has no history of rocket launches. It's not really surprising at all that it's going to take a while to approve. And don't forget that SN8 launched without FAA approval, so if the government really wanted to shut down Starship, then that was their silver bullet. Literally and metaphorically, right? Because it looks like a bullet. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, I don't doubt that SpaceX will get approval for Starship this year. I've stated several times now that Falcon Heavy is already fully cleared to launch from Boca Chica, and I can't imagine Starship's environmental impact being that much greater. And flicking back to this drone shot of Ship 20 being lowered, you can really see just how expansive these wetlands are, and how the impact of Starship should hopefully be pretty much negligible in the grand scheme of things. Although, I'm not an environmental scientist, so my words doesn't really mean very much. <laughs> As for future Starship prototypes, Ship 21 was finally stacked. Or Ship 22. Not sure what the correct numbering would be, but I think most have settled on calling this Ship 22. Why the confusion? Well, the nose cone of this vehicle is Ship 21's, but it's stacked on top of Ship 22's tank section. Now, why would SpaceX do this and build a Franken Starship? I mean, it's not like Ship 21's tank section isn't constructed. In fact, you can see it just to the left of the high bay in this shot here. We believe that the reason that SpaceX decided this mismatched ship stack is because the attachment points that connect the booster and Starship were changed between the construction of Ship 21 and 22. Ship 21's tank section has the old attachment points, while Ship 22 has the new ones. Now, Ship 21 was originally meant to fly with Booster 5, but now this booster has been retired, Ship 21 is now expected to be mated with Booster 7, which has the new attachment points, and therefore Ship 22's tank section would be needed. I do think it would be kind of nice, though, to at least make a mock-up nose cone for Ship 21's tank section, and then mate it with Booster 5, as it would make a pretty cool monument, kind of like the Saturn V exhibits at the Kennedy Space Center and the Johnson Space Center. Anyway, work will continue on Ship 22 throughout the week, SpaceX have already begun mounting its aero flaps, and the gaps in its heat shield will need to get filled in as well. But I'm sure I'm not alone in admiring just how clean
insane the heat shield is. It's amazing how with each iteration of Starship, everything just always looks so much more elegant. We've certainly come a long way from the days of the Mark 1 Starship. I'm sure we can all extend a huge round of applause to the people that built this thing. Austin Barnard is a good friend of this show, and he of course now works at Starbase. Last week he shared this great picture of the team in front of the beast they've created, with a bonus view of some jet planes in the background. We'll talk about those a little bit later on in the video. First though, while we're still kind of on the subject of future starships, one place where they'll be assembled is the new Mega Bay, the wider sibling of the High Bay. Another level of this monstrous building was completed last week, meaning the structure is now very close to completion. In other Starbase news, methane has finally started being delivered to the orbital tank farm, something we've not actually seen before. Interestingly, we've seen SpaceX test the liquid nitrogen and liquid oxygen tanks, but never the two methane ones. Despite the tank farm being pretty much completed nearly four months ago, in October 2021, we're now starting to fear that this is because these tanks haven't actually been approved for use and, in fact, can't ever be approved for use, as they're in violation of Texas laws surrounding the construction of stationary liquid natural gas installations. The law states that any structure containing liquid methane must be protected by a six-foot tall retaining wall, along with some other stipulations contained in this absolute page-turner of a document which these two methane tanks don't comply with. SpaceX have installed these two horizontal liquid methane tanks alongside the farm, and it was these two tanks that were filled. Now, it remains to be seen what will happen to the two vertical tanks, but the fact that they are apparently in violation of Texas laws is our best guess as to why they've never been filled up so far. Now, one of my favourite ever clips of Starbase is this one, initially shared by Elon Musk on Twitter, and it's of the Inspiration4 crew flying over Starbase. Inspiration4, of course, was the all-civilian crew dragon flight that we saw back in September last year. Well, it seems that the man behind it, billionaire Jared Isaacman, has well and truly caught the space bug, and he's now commissioned a further three crewed space flights. And to boot, he did another epic Starbase flyover. The first mission has been named Polaris Dawn, and will be a five-day trip during which the crew will conduct scientific research on board the Crew Dragon spacecraft. Launching no earlier than the fourth quarter of this year, the flight plan will see the Dragon fly higher than any Dragon mission to date, and will in fact be aiming to achieve the highest ever Earth orbit flown by humans, finally dethroning Gemini 11, which reached an apogee of 1,368 kilometers back in 1966. The Dragon's orbit will, in fact, take it through portions of the Van Allen radiation belt, and during these periods, the crew will conduct research to improve our understanding of the effects of spaceflight and space radiation on human health. This includes, but won't be limited to, using ultrasound to monitor venous gas emboli, or simply gas bubbles that form in the veins, gathering data on the radiation environment itself to better understand how space radiation affects humans, and conduct research relating to spaceflight-associated neuroocular disorder, which describes a number of pathologies that can manifest in the eyes of astronauts, which can include optic disc swelling in one or both eyes, hyperopic refractive error shift, and the development of small areas of ischemia in the retina. You know, considering my background in eyes, maybe I could do a dedicated video on spaceflight-associated neuroocular disorder. What do you think? If you're interested, let me know in the comments below. And hey, while you're down there, dropping a like and a subscription really helps support these videos, and I always do appreciate it. And subscribing, of course, helps ensure that you never miss a weekly space update. Anyway, another similarity this mission has to Gemini 11 is that it'll feature a spacewalk. This will be the first ever commercial spacewalk, approximately 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface. The crew will use SpaceX-designed EVA suits, upgraded from the standard IVA suits that we've seen so far. We've not had any images or previews about what these spacesuits might look like, aside from Kerbal Space Program's interpretation, so I'm excited to see how they eventually turn out. Joining Jared Isaacman for the flight will be Kid Petit, a retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, a command pilot with over 3,200 flying hours in numerous flying machines. Also along for the ride will be Mission Specialist Sarah Gillis, a lead space operations engineer at SpaceX, responsible for overseeing the company's astronaut training program, and Mission Specialist and Medical Officer Anna Menon, another lead space operations engineer at SpaceX, where she manages the development of crew operations and serves in mission control as both a mission director and crew communicator. So that's Polaris Dawn. 
Now, as for the other two crewed missions, very little is known at this stage. The second mission will probably be broadly similar to the first, taking place on board a Crew Dragon spacecraft. The third and final mission, though, will be the first ever human spaceflight on Starship. A vehicle, of course, which needs no introduction among this show's audience, I'm sure. It's the world's first fully reusable spacecraft. Obviously, SpaceX will probably want to get a few missions under Starship's belt before considering crewed flights, so I think once Starship is operational, it'll mostly be cargo missions like Starlink V2 at first, and I can't really see Mission 3 taking place anytime too soon right now. A human spaceflight that is happening right now, though, is Expedition 66, the crew that's currently aboard the International Space Station. This week, they welcomed the Progress MS-19 spacecraft, a resupply mission that launched on the 15th of February, carrying just over 400 kilograms of fuel for the space station, 420 litres of water for the tanks of the Rodnik system, and 40 kilograms of compressed air in the tanks of the oxygen supply system. In addition to some scientific payloads, the pressurised section of the vehicle contained about 1.5 kilograms of dry cargo for the crew, including new cable sets for upgrading the Nyorka module, medical and hygiene supplies, clothing and food packages for the Expedition 66 crew. Progress MS-19 wasn't the only flight to the International Space Station last week, we also saw the Cygnus NG-17 mission, which launched on the 19th of February aboard an Antares 230 rocket. The Cygnus spacecraft isn't too dissimilar to the Russian Progress spacecraft, it's an uncrewed robotic resupply mission to the International Space Station. This flight carried about four tons of research, hardware and crew supplies. This mission is also interesting because alongside the standard delivery of cargo, the Cygnus spacecraft will perform a reboost of the International Space Station, something never conducted by a Cygnus spacecraft before. The space station's orbit decays over time, and it begins to naturally fall back into the Earth's atmosphere, so it needs to be reboosted like this from time to time. Now, we were hoping to see SpaceX's latest Starlink mission last week on the 20th of February, but this was sadly delayed due to unfavourable recovery weather. The new launch date is today, February the 21st, at 9.44 Eastern Standard Time. I can't wait to tell you all about this mission, and hopefully how successful it was, next time on Space This Week. I make these videos every single Monday, and I couldn't do it without the wonderful support of my channel members and patrons, whose names are now scrolling on the left. You can sign up to either the membership program or to Patreon to get these videos a little bit early, and I'm still planning on some way of making exclusive content too, but I'm trying to find the best way to do this with my current schedule, so I have to ask for your patience on this for now. There are also two other video suggestions on screen for my channel, hopefully they're good picks, but I'll sign off by once again saying a massive thank you for watching, and I'll see you all next time.